There are still fur trappers. They move along the dry white snow of the far north and the dry brown earth of the equatorial jungles, hunting and trapping the seal, the mink, the sable, the otter, the chinchilla, the beaver, the ermine, the lynx, the leopard, the ocelot, the fox, the wolf, the wolverine. The men who turn the furs into fur coats are the lions of the industry. Around them prowl the lesser beasts, the button sellers, the embroidery sellers, the thread sellers. This is Maxwell Ronan, a lesser beast. He has a wife named Betty and a 19-year-old son named Bert. He sells linings. William Saxer is an unsuccessful fur designer. He has a picture of himself in his mind. He stands at the door of his own salon, bowing curtly, as famous women enter to buy fur designs by Saxer. You know, Saxer, when you get your own place, I'm going to sell you 5,000 yards of nylon satin at one time. I'll have my own place, Max. It's a matter of time. You know how much I believe you, Saxer? I'll take your order right now, for day after tomorrow. I'm ready. The young man is called Sidney. He went to work for his uncle after he was fired by four different employers to whom he was not related. Sidney's uncle rents furs to theatrical productions, to television shows, and to people who want to make an impression. 24 hours a day, there is an angry fire in the pit of Sidney's stomach. He knows that so long as he works for his uncle, he will continue to be Sidney without a last name. Aha! What's the matter? Well, you never saw this cigarette burn, did you? How many times do I have to tell you, don't take a fur back from mental without examining it? How did she talk you out of it, eh? What'd she do? Give you a phone number? So you'll take it out of my pay, but don't lecture me. You don't have any pay. You're three weeks in advance into me now. So you'll take it out four weeks from now. Don't worry, you, you horse player, you, you tramp. You're no good stupid, you. Listen, Uncle George. Drop dead, my nephew. Creator of the earth. You made my life bitter from the day I was born. I forgive you, but what you did to me with this nephew? Let's not talk about it. I'll buy and sell you, Uncle George. You see me the day after tomorrow. Pipe Dream. Is that the name of the horse? Huh? Here. Bet a quarter on him for me. If I didn't have you working for me, I could afford him at half a dollar. A man who sells linings knows that every great accomplishment is made up of 10 or 100 or 1,000 pieces carefully joined. For 18 months now, Max Ronan has been arranging and rearranging pieces of a crime. You have seen the opportunity, the participants, and the motive.
What are you doing? Timing him. Every one of those lines is a minute. Libby, of course. Actually. Hey, you guys, you want to see this man? He's got problems. Well, that's Detective Flint over there, and this is Detective Arcaro. You can take it up with him. What's the trouble? He'll tell you. Sit down. I want you to arrest me, sir. What'd you do wrong? If you don't arrest me, I'm gonna kill my father. I almost killed him this morning. I walked out just in time. Now it's getting harder and harder not to go back. Honey, business. Why you have this idea you want to kill him? I don't want to discuss my personal business with strangers, sir. When you say you almost killed him, you mean with a knife, a gun, you know, a weapon? No, I tried to kill him with my fist. Do you want to tell us your name? Not until after you arrest me. Well, we can't arrest you. Intention before the fact isn't a crime. We can only arrest you if you've actually done something illegal or criminal. Look, why don't we send for your father? You could talk to him here, discuss your problems. <laughs> He's a psycho, doesn't know what he's doing. Hello. Parker speaking. I got a metal case per sec up here in the squad room. Yeah, send me some men. Right away. Everything's going to be all right. You hear that? Everything's going to be all right. home this time. What happened? That's silly. After all these years, I still can't find Max, the right What key. happened? Did you have a f accident? What happened to you? Let me see. You want me to call the doctor? Sit down, Betty. I want to talk you to you. Want me to get something for you? A cup of coffee? Sit down, Betty. How long have you known about this other woman of mine? I didn't want you to know. I was ashamed. Fantastic woman. I didn't know you knew. On my word of honor, I, I tried not to let you know. When you come into the house at night, I can tell by your footsteps whether your business was good or bad. Betty, our son came to the place this morning. 
He saw you with... I stood there like a piece of wood. I didn't touch him, Betty. I didn't lay a hand on him. It's not right. A son has no right to raise his hand against his father. He had no right, Max. Betty, in all our married life, I never looked at another woman. I'm, I'm not a chaser. It happens. You hear stories about it happening all the time. I want a divorce. Say it so simply. Isn't it possible for us to go on a little longer? Divorce is so final. I didn't want it to happen. I fought it like a mule. But I want her. She's in my mind night and day. Lie for her, steal for her. Even kill for her. Would she be good for you, Max? I can't breathe without her. Forgive me, Betty. You've been biting your fingernails. They're wearing big pockets. You're a slob, Kados. You've been spoiled rotten for five years. Go to work for Gilboa and see what you get. You make them, I sell them. You don't like my opinions, don't ask me my opinions. They want make with big pockets, okay. My wife wears a cloth coat. Oh, not... All right, let's not get nerves. We got a lot of work to do before the showing tomorrow. What's the matter with big pockets? Did I say anything was the matter? Did I complain? I didn't jump up in the air and do a somersault. Sue me. What are you going to do? Ask you now, look, 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 why don't you go be friendly to your wife? What's the matter, you bugged because I'm married? Are you kidding? So, uh, what's the beef? Your wife wears a cloth coat. So did I ask you to marry me? Jingle, jingle. My alarm clock rings louder than that when it wakes me up in the morning. <laughs> Get him out of here. I'm going to 
to get him a private room. Nurse is 24 hours a day. He doesn't need another room. He needs another world. Tell me, Max. <laughs> are you going to make him a world without pain again? What does he want from me? I'm not divorcing him. He wants to ask me some questions, but he was nice enough to let me see the boy first. Well, now you've seen him. Go answer the man's questions. And when he asks you how your face got hurt, tell him it's full of splinters from your son's broken mind. never to wait for you on a street corner. My son is in the hospital. There's a telephone. I'm through, Estelle. Is that you, Max? Close the door. We'll be right there. What's got to be so private? Close that door! I'm through, Estelle. The whole plan, the whole scheme, the whole robbery, the whole mess. The whole rotten, dumb business. What's so dumb about a million bucks? It's blood money. Blood money? You want to know about blood money? Seventy-three eighty a week. To let the buyers watch me walk around in a bathing suit under a fur coat. So they can watch me take it off with their dirty little eyes. Go ahead with Saxer and Sidney. Goodbye, Max. And when your kid needs a doctor, don't worry where the money is. You can always get up in the morning and go downtown and kiss Mr. Warfield's foot so you can sell him a hundred yards of lining. Max! Ten years from now, when you're 60 and it's cold, you just remember you walked out on everything. Talk to each other later. We got a lot to go over tonight. Tell him what he can do if he doesn't like it. Now shut that door and wait for me! That's for what we did to my son. Cranes waken in the meadow with a cry. And in the lime groves, the drone of the mate beetles is heard no more. Empty, empty, empty. Horror, horror, horror. Cold, cold, cold. <coughs> Hi. Uh, Hi. Oh, Mace, I want you to meet Adam. Adam, this is Mace. You in the industry? Adam is a detective. Uh, I only do this for a living. Mace is an actor. We're doing a scene together. We rehearse between orders. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. Mace is playing Constantine. <laughs> you see, Mother doesn't love me. And no wonder. She wants to live, to love, to wear gay clothes. And here am I, a man of 25 years, constantly reminding her that she is no longer young. Mm. Anybody ever tell you you ought to be an actor? Gentle public? 
you have found me out. Well, that's the way the mop flops. We ham it up with the ham and eggs. Good, that's what I'll have. Sunny side up. Adam and Eve on a raft. I am lonely, lonely. No fault of mine. Once in every hundred years, I open my mouth to speak. That's why you're lonely. Now, will you cut it out? I have to learn this. Adam. No kidding. My voice echoes forlornly in the desert, and no one hears. Hey, did you hear that? A lady hermit. So what's new? Such a nice day, I thought I'd walk. That's nice. Hmm? Do it now. Fill this place up good. So we go to sleep too. Yeah. Now concentrate on how much money you're gonna have two hours from now. Miss Reeves. Fine. Open up for me, will you, Chris? Mr. Warfield wants me to try on a coat to see how it fits. Quiet, huh? Would have driven me out of my mind 20 years ago. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. So you get a call. So you hold them a second. Come on, boys. That's a freight, buddy. I got a pickup order for some fur coats from uh, Warfield... Frayers? Mm -hmm. Warfield Frayers. Uh, Mr. Warfield, the Odessa Freight Company. Boy, would my wife give her left arm for one of these. Are you men bonded? <laughs> okay, Mr. Warfield, don't get excited. Just a crack. All right, Sam, let's proceed. All right, boys, count them. There's supposed to be a hundred coats there. Is that necessary? 
Well, Mr. Warfield, like I said, we're bonded. You wouldn't want me to show up with 99, would you? They got your beat on that button, Mac. Used to be the thing would make a noise. You rang the bell long enough, you gave the elevator guy a headache. Now it lights up. A lot he cares, a light lights up. <laughs> they got you nervous, all those fur coats, huh? Hey, for crying out loud, I asked you to wait. You can't wait five minutes. You think you're the only call I got? Uh, let's go, let's go. Come on, boys. Boys, there's a hundred of them. You want to count them? What would you do with it if you took one? Give it to your wife? How much money do you make a week? Yeah, 90, 100. Oh, your wife would look great walking around in a $10,000 coat, huh? No, I could sell it. Oh, you know what, Fence? Yeah. You see, you steal a valuable thing like that, you got a white elephant on your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Buddy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you've all given us all sorts of information. Uh, we've built this picture of the robbery and how it was accomplished. That's it, on those blackboards. We're going through the whole thing. And if you have anything to add or correct, now's the time. Okay, Adam, pick it up from there. Well, this is to be a formal public showing of the new fur coat models and designs by Warfield Frears. Now, for the showing, two rooms have been rented two days. A showing room, the so-called governor room, on mezzanine A, and a separate smaller room, one flight upstairs, on mezzanine B. And the purpose of the second room is to keep the fur coats in. There's a uniformed guard stationed outside of the door 24 hours of the day. Yesterday morning, the coats were delivered to the governor room. They were kept there all day during the rehearsal. Last night, about 7 o'clock, they were brought upstairs to the smaller room where they were to remain until they were needed downstairs again this morning at about 11 o'clock. Now, at 9.25 this morning, Miss Reeves came upstairs and entered the room, accompanied by the private guard. I gave strict orders. Nobody was to go into the room with the coats without the guards with them except me. Those were my orders. Everybody knew these orders? I made it common knowledge. I knew it, and I made sure all my girls knew it. Go ahead, Adam. 9.25. 
Downstairs in the governor room, there's a coffee break taking place. Miss Reeves comes upstairs. Now, in this room across the hall, a men's room, from the evidence we have found of cigarette butts lying about the floor and an empty men's clothing box left in a sink, two or more of the members of the robbery gang are waiting. Now, it's very possible that one of them is changing clothes, from street clothes to the uniform of a private policeman. Miss Reeves, accompanied by the guard, enters the room, and the hall is empty. Miss Reeves, did anyone know in advance that you were coming upstairs at that time? Well, Mr. Warfield sent me up there because it was the coffee break and it was a good time. Was there any reason for sending you up at that time? Well, I told him that I thought I ought not to model one particular coat. Was that something that came up this morning? I brought it up for the first time yesterday afternoon. The coat was too big for me. That's right. I was too busy to worry about it yesterday, but this morning I thought she might be right. So I sent her up to put on the coat and come downstairs and show me. It was about 9.25. And at about 11 o'clock, he went upstairs to get the rest of the coats. In other words, you didn't see Miss Reeves for about an hour and a half. Didn't you think that was funny? To tell the truth, I sent her up there and then she slipped out of my mind. I just had too much to think about to worry about where a model was. Mr. Tellison, would you mind stepping up to the blackboard and show us what happened after you and Miss Reeves entered that room? Miss Reeves went in first. She went in the bathroom here. To change my clothes. You see, we wear bathing suits underneath the coats, and I wanted Mr. Warfield to see how the coat fit over a bathing suit. And she closed the door. Where were you standing? Here. Back to the door? Back to the door. Then somebody tried to grab me, and I started to yell or something because I smelled the chloroform. But the minute my mouth was open, the chloroform got in me, and I got dizzy. That's all I remember. Norman Reeves, will you show us? I was in here, and I heard a noise. That was Chris falling down, I guess. I had just opened up my hat box to take out a bathing suit, and I came out to see what the noise was. Just a moment. Didn't you call out what's the matter first? That's what you told us before. Well, uh, I, I called Chris through the door. That's what I meant when I said I called out what's the matter. He didn't answer, so I opened up the door and he was on the floor. I thought he had a heart attack or something. You didn't smell the chloroform? Well, maybe I did. How many things can you think of at the same time? The main thing is, Chris was on the floor, and I leaned down over him, and that's when they put the chloroform over my mouth and nose. They? They? Well, that's the way it seems to me. Well, I'm not sure. I didn't see anybody. Now, they came on you from behind. Yeah. I guess they were right over there by the door. Is that all? Yes, unless you can think of anything else. Now, Mr. Belmont, at approximately five minutes past ten, three men dressed in brown uniforms... You know, like uh, moving men wear. Now, these three men, they came up in your elevator, and they got off on mezzanine B. And they asked you to wait as if they're in a hurry. This is Detective R. Carroll, 65th Precinct. I'm checking on an order to pick up some furs at the Governor Clinton Hotel. This is about 10 o'clock this morning at the Hotel Governor Clinton. Could you check Go your ahead, check. I'll Tell me out. if you're the moving company that picked up about 100... Look, it's got to be an inside job. How can you fit an operation like this into the cracks of a schedule without having inside information? That still leaves a pretty wide field. The private policeman on duty outside, the model Estelle still Reeves, Warfield himself. Any more about Warfield from the insurance company? They're still going over his books. First impression is he's in solid shape. So what does he gain by robbing himself? Maybe he wants to hold out cash on the tax people. If he really is in solid shape, makes him a good alibi. Doesn't figure, really. A guy in business for 30 years with a clean reputation? What about the private policeman? Clean record. Was on the force until he retired. The Reeves one was clean, too, as far as that goes. How about the other models? Nothing. But, Mike, I'm with you. Whoever did this job had to know the fur business and had to know the schedule. The key to this whole deal are those guys that move the racks of coats. But they're legitimate. We'll soon find out. Can you check your records and tell me if you're the moving company that picked up about a hundred fur coats? Thank you. 
I'm up to the M's. I understand the alphabet goes all the way to Z. Believe it or not, there's four of them. Keep going. Thank you, yes, Lieutenant. I've got something here. Odessa Freight Company. They got a record of the pickup this morning. Yeah. the electric company or they shut it off. I'll bet you a nickel there's no phone here either. Where's your coats, Mr. Warfield? This is mine, all right. I wonder why they left them behind. These are useless to them. These are originals, extreme designs. If you went to sell them, they'd be spotted in a minute by anybody in the trade. How much are they worth? Retail between eleven and fifteen thousand apiece. Sydney, that's every penny I have in the world. Uh, what's this for? There's only two ways that we can get rid of these coats, through a fence or legitimate. If we go through a fence, we'll only get 20% of these coats' real value. But if we sell them off over a year, out of town, large cities, one, two, three coats at a time, we'll get full wholesale value. We've got to be patient. That's what this money is for, so we can afford to be patient. All right? All right. I'll make my first trip out of town tomorrow, Chicago. <laughs> what do you think Uncle George would say if he knew he had three quarters of a million dollars in his vault? Why don't you ask him? <laughs> satisfied? I'm satisfied. Stand still in a room for 15 minutes. What are you going to do on that airplane for three hours?
Who is it? It's me, Max. Will you let me in, please? Can I talk to you alone? Now, what have we got to say to each other, Betty? Why don't you just leave it alone? The boy is dead. A blood vessel broke in his brain. A stroke. I wanted, I wanted to tell you myself. I knew it'd be a shock. I can do. Is there anything you want me to do for you? Max, I've been thinking about it all night. Don't eat your heart out. Don't feel guilty. It, the boy was wrong. Max. Don't you die, too. Please, I mean it. Pleased to meet you. You figure the reason the Reeves woman planted the bit about the coat being too big is so she could get up there and decoy the guards out of the hall. It's possible. She knew he'd have to follow her in. What were the guys doing hiding out in the men's room if they didn't figure somebody's gonna come along and get rid of the guard? Well, maybe they figured someone had to come along and waited their chance. It's possible. The nose was a little thicker, I think. At the bridge or the base? Oh, uh, across the top here. The ba at the bridge. Now, how many times did you see this man before he signed the lease for the warehouse? Oh, I saw him two or three times. Just the one man? That's all, just this one man. He came in, told me what he was looking for, and I showed him two or three places before he rented the one he took. Did you check him out for references? Well, this bank in Chicago, the same one the rent check was written on. You checked it back to see if the references were okay? Well, I wrote them. They said there was a Stacia Fur Company with an account there about six months old. No, nothing special one way or the other. Lieutenant, this is the man you want to speak to. What's your trouble, sir? I want to turn myself in. What for? For killing my son, I suppose. Except you can't punish me for that because of the way I did it. Only God can punish me for that. But uh, about a fur robbery at the Governor Clinton Hotel yesterday. Won't you sit 
sit down, uh, Mr. Uh, Ronan. Maxwell Ronan. I, uh, I want to tell you everything. Now, this is it. 1,400 square feet, 900 a month, five years. First month in advance, two months security. And you'll renovate according to my instructions. Paint, partition, the new light fixtures, everything. This is a big move for me. I've been wanting my own place for 20 years now. Plus, real estate. Yes, he's here. Mr. Saxe? Oh. I left word at my place where I'd be. I'm expecting a call from my decorator. I thought I'd meet him here after I signed the lease. Perfectly all right. Mr. Milton, this is Jack Saxer. Sidney, so what are you telling me? Sidney! Is there anything wrong, Mr. Saxon? He was a thief in his heart. These are not your coats, Uncle George. In my shop, the coats are my coats. No, these are not yours. I... I stole them. But not from you. They're not yours. You stole them. But not from me. And you hid them in my shop? stories in the naked city. This has been one of them.
This has been a Screen Gems film presentation from Columbia Pictures, produced by Herbert B. Leonard.